right well good afternoon everyone good to be back in the briefing room after several weeks of travel just a few things at the top and then we'll get right to your questions uh, on Friday, Secretary Austin concluded a productive trip to Brussels, where he hosted the 23rd session of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group on June 13, followed by his participation in the NATO Defense Ministerial on June 14. The UDCG once again brought together representatives from over 50 countries to discuss and coordinate security assistance for Ukraine as they continue to defend against Russian aggression. The meeting underscored the continued commitment, unity, and resolve of allies and partners to help bolster Ukraine's defense infrastructure and support its sovereignty both in the near and long term. The subsequent NATO defense ministerial afforded NATO allies the opportunity to discuss several critical issues, including enhanced support for Ukraine, strengthening NATO's deterrence and defense capabilities, and preparation for the upcoming NATO summit in Washington. During the ministerial, NATO defense ministers reaffirmed their commitment to providing sustained military assistance to Ukraine. The ministerial was the last major milestone prior to the upcoming NATO 75th anniversary summit, which is scheduled for here in Washington, D.C. from July 9 through 11. Notably, the summit will bring together leaders and defense ministers, ministers from all 32 NATO member countries to commemorate our enduring alliance and address critical global security challenges. The summit will also underscore our unwavering mutual commitment to collective defense, transatlantic unity, and ongoing support for Ukraine. We'll have much more to provide about the summit in the near future. Shifting gears on June 9, Marines with the 24th Marine Expeditionary Unit deployed AV-8B Harrier jets, MV-22B Osprey tilt rotor aircraft and personnel to Ronneby Airport in Kalingay, Sweden for exercise ball tops 24. The detachment, part of Marine Medium Tilt Rotor Squadron 365, demonstrates the ability to project force over 900 nautical miles and establish a forward operating base, enhancing combined response capability and interoperability in the Baltic Sea region. For more information on Exercise Ball Tops 24, please contact U.S. Marine Corps Public Affairs. And finally, the department announced today at Fort Liberty, North Carolina, a first-of-its-kind partnership with Duke Energy to power five major military installations in North and South Carolina with solar electricity. Through this procurement, Duke Energy will provide carbon-free electricity to five major military installations in North and South Carolina, including U.S. Army Fort Liberty, Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune, Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point, and Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in North Carolina, and Shaw Air Force Base in South Carolina. The contract, valued at $248 million, will provide an estimated 4.8 million megawatt hours of carbon-free energy over a 15-year delivery period from two newly constructed off-site solar facilities in South Carolina. By supporting the construction of new clean renewable energy, we're enhancing our resilience in support of the Warfighter and DOD mission. For additional information about this unique initiative, I'd refer you to Fort Liberty Public Affairs. With that, I'd be happy to take your questions. I see AP is out of the room today, so we'll go ahead and start with Liz here. Put you on the spot. Great. Um, I guess uh, just to follow up on the continued Houthi attacks, um, a mariner was killed, um, a different mari mariner was critically injured. Um, you know, what is the Pentagon, what is CENTCOM going to do differently to prevent these from happening? Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, again, you know, we're very focused on uh, ensuring that these kinds of attacks uh, are degraded, uh, that the Houthis uh, will continue to understand that there's going to be a price to be paid for uh, essentially preventing freedom of navigation in this vital international uh, waterway, uh, and, and it's just completely unacceptable. So uh, again, uh, we, we continue to uh, work very closely with partners in the region uh, to provide capabilities to safeguard maritime uh, travel through the, the Red Sea and elsewhere. And um, we'll continue to stay very focused on that. Um, a separate topic. Um, last week uh, in Brussels, Secretary Austin called on more um, NATO countries to up their defense spending. Um, what specifically is the U.S. doing to, you know, get that to happen, to have those other countries just spend more on their defenses? Well, I think you, you've seen, you know, not only Secretary Austin, uh, but the Secretary General has talked, uh, of NATO has talked about this. Um, you know, it, it's very important 
that we as NATO allies all contribute uh, to our collective defense. Now, I won't speak for individual nations, and, and I think the Secretary's words on this speak for itself, um, other than to say that, that we all have a vested interest in making sure a strong, secure NATO. Uh, and I think what you continue to see are NATO allies stepping up uh, to do that. So um, I'm confident that will continue to be a topic of discussion to include at the upcoming summit. Carla. Thanks. Um, who does the Pentagon assess to be the current global leader of Islamic State? There's been some confusion about that recently. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, uh, I'm sure you're tracking that uh, ISIS declared last year that uh, Abu Hafs al-Hashimi al-Karashi uh, is its fifth leader. Um, you know, they, they run to a, a succession of leaders. Doesn't seem to be a long life expectancy these days. Um, so, you know, not a lot of information out there publicly available. Um, but again, you know, I'm, I'm sure you could uh, reach out to DNI and they could help you deep dive on that. Also, to follow up on Ukraine and F-16s, how many pilots does the U.S. and its allies in the UDCG expect to be ready um, to fly F-16s this summer? So that's really a question that's best addressed by Ukraine. You know, they're the, they should be the ones to talk about pilot management in terms of the overall size of their fleet, their overall size of their pilot cadre, and what their expectations are in terms of um, how they're going to implement that program. Our focus is on working uh, with the Air Capability Coalition to identify what their requirements are and then meeting those requirements. And as you know, uh, training being conducted both in Arizona and in Denmark, uh, there's the capacity to conduct additional training at other locations uh, you know, that are being prepared in Europe. Uh, because again, this will be a long-term proposition in terms of, of supporting them through the Air uh, Capability Coalition. Next, Tom. Uh, Pat, any update on the Gaza Pier, when it will be up and running again? And also with the airdrops, when do you expect them to resume? Yeah, in terms of the, uh, the J-LOTs, um, we expect uh, it will go operational again this week. And I don't have a specific date to give you right now, but of course we'll keep you posted on that. As far as airdrops go, um, we do have the capability and do intend to con continue conducting airdrops. So again, as those happen, we'll make, you know, CENCOM will post on them. airdrops. Um, th there is no holdup per se. There's always going to be a variety of factors to take into account to include the conditions on the ground, the weather. Uh, and so, you know, very similar to the pier, uh, you've got to take a variety of, of factors into account when making those decisions. Uh, but again, you know, kind of, you didn't ask this, but, but to your point, uh, this is a multifaceted effort to get aid into Gaza, whether it be via land, air, or sea, we're going to continue to do what we need to do to make that happen. Thank you, Laura. And then I'll go to the side of the room, I promise. Thank you. Um, so the New York Times just reported, uh, based on aid groups, saying that the pier could be dismantled as early as this uh, coming month in July. Is that accurate? Uh, look, we've said all along, first of all, that the pier is a uh, temporary measure. Um, I don't have any dates to announce in terms of when it will cease operations. Of course, as I just mentioned, we're, we're looking forward to getting it operational again soon uh, and to delivering aid. Um, and, you know, we're going to capitalize on uh, on the conditions, uh, you know, uh, in terms of weather to get as much aid across that pier as we can. Is there a delay in getting the pier back operational now or is it not repaired? Well, as you know, I went to Ashdod to get repaired, and, and I just said, again, it's going to get, uh, we expect that it will go operational again this week. Okay. And then I just wanted to ask you uh, to see if you would confirm uh, the reports last week that the U.S. is sending an additional Patriot to Ukraine from Poland. Uh, again, I don't have anything to announce uh, in terms of uh, additional Patriots for Ukraine. Uh, as you saw Secretary Austin say at the contact group uh, and, and during the NATO defense ministerials, Air defense continues to be a high priority uh, for Ukraine, and we're going to continue to work closely with allies and partners to ensure they, they have what they need to defend their people. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you, General. Uh, a question on Iraq. In this January, you started a meeting with the Iraqi government, about the HNC meetings, high military commission meetings, to discuss about the future of U.S.-led global coalition in Iraq. It's been six months past, and do you have any updates for me? Well, where are you in these meetings? Have you got any decision about the future of the U.S.-led global coalition in Iraq and the U.S. military presence? 
Um, as I understand it, uh, so far, uh, the working groups continue to meet. Um, within the coming weeks, uh, my understanding is that participants intend to have another principals meeting uh, where coalition leaders will receive a, a progress update. Uh, but as of right now, I don't have anything additional to, to is pass on. Is deadline for these meetings? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but again, I mean, obviously the, the groups are coming together to talk about very important things to include, you know, one, what is the current threat that ISIS poses? What is the operating environment? Uh, and looking at Iraqi security forces state uh, capabilities. And so, again, I think um, understanding that this is a very important um, discussion and, and a very important set of meetings, they're going to continue to stay focused on making progress in that regard, but I just don't want to get ahead of it and speculate on, on when specifically they will be ready to make any type of announcements. Yes, sir. Thank you, General. Several official sources report that it is important the U.S. continue to collaborate with international coalition forces, the Peshmerga and the Iraqi army to prevent the reorganization of ISIS. What is your comment on this? Well, you know, look, um, the Iraqi security forces, uh, to include uh, Peshmerga, have had uh, significant impact on ISIS's ability to conduct the kind of terror operations that we saw, you know, a decade ago. Uh, and so that, that's a real testament to the capabilities uh, and the effectiveness of these forces working together uh, in the region. So, uh, you know, kind of related to uh, your, your colleague's question there, we're going to continue to work closely uh, with the Iraqi government uh, and other partners in the region uh, to, to include the Peshmerga uh, when it comes to what is the ISIS threat, what do we need to do to ensure that it can't resurge in the way that, it, that it had, we had seen it do earlier, uh, and, and make sure that um, at the same time, uh, that our partners have the capabilities that they need to be able to ensure uh, that ISIS doesn't come back, the enduring defeat of ISIS. Thank you. Let me go to the phone here real quick. Dan Lamoth, Washington Post. Thanks, General. Appreciate your time. Um, on these Houthi, the Houthi attacks, uh, we've had a number of discussions this year about interdiction. Uh, clearly, weapons are still getting in. Clear that, cl clearly, that remains a challenge. Is there anything more uh, that the Pentagon, the U.S. military can do there uh, to get after that problem? Uh, and then uh, relatedly, uh, earlier this year, we saw a number of kind of large wave attacks by the U.S. military and allies on the Houthis. Uh, in light of these attacks over the last several days, uh, at least one of which was deadly, is there a reason we haven't seen something similar um, of late? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, so a, a few things, you know, so first of all, again, uh, keeping in mind what we're focused on here, which is uh, safety and freedom of navigation when it comes to uh, this, this vital waterway, the Red Sea, through which 10 to 15 percent of international commerce uh, traverses. And so that is something that we're going to continue to stay focused on. Um, and in terms of um, Houthi strikes, I think uh, yes, you know, it is incredibly unfortunate that some of these strikes have struck vessels as recently as, as this week, as you saw, uh, or over this weekend. Um, and um, it's also important to highlight the, the impact that U.S. Uh, and international forces have had in terms of thwarting many of these attacks and safeguarding shipping and the lives of mariners. And so we're going to continue to stay focused on that. As you highlight, this is a whole of government effort in terms of looking at other levers by which we can uh, compel the Houthis to uh, stop. But our primary focus is on degrading and disrupting uh, their ability to conduct these kinds of attacks. Uh, and in terms of other things that can be done, uh, you know, I, I think that continuing to put the spotlight uh, from various groups to include the media into the impacts that Yemen's attacks are having on its own citizens uh, in terms of their economic, uh, environmental, uh, and health, uh, as well as those, their neighbors in the region, uh, you know, would shed some additional context and perspective in terms of uh, the fact that, that these strikes are not 
uh, in any way contributing to uh, supporting the Palestinian people that are in fact acts of terrorism that are, if anything, uh, making life worse for the average Yemeni uh, and the people that live in the region. Uh, if you want to talk about people doing things to help the Palestinians, uh, look at the amount of aid that's going into Gaza. Uh, and all we see the, uh, the Houthis doing are launching missiles and, and trying to kill innocent mariners. All right, let me go to uh, Phil Stewart, Reuters. Uh, thanks. Um, I'd like to get your reaction uh, to Russian President Putin's visit to uh, North Korea, where he pledged invariable support uh, for Pyongyang. Uh, Victor Cha said this deepening uh, Russia-North Korea relationship uh, poses the greatest threat to U.S. national security since the Korean War. Uh, is he right? Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, again, you know, we're, we're aware... Uh, of, of the upcoming visit both to uh, Pyongyang and, and Hanoi. Um, and you've heard others say this too, uh, the, the, co the deepening cooperation between Russia and the DPRK uh, is something uh, that should be of concern, uh, especially to anyone that's interested in maintaining peace and stability on the, the Korean peninsula, uh, but also supporting the people of Ukraine as they continue to fight against Russian aggression. Uh, and so, of course, you know, you're well aware of uh, DPRK providing uh, ammunition and weapons to Russia that's been able to help them uh, perpetuate their illegal and unprovoked war uh, against the Ukrainian people. So it's something that we're going to continue to keep an eye on. I would say, though, taking a step back, our focus when it comes to uh, the Indo-Pacific region and the Korean Peninsula is on working with allies and partners to promote peace, stability, and security in the region, and that will continue to be our focus. Thank you. Can I follow up that issue of uh, Putin visit to uh, North Korea here already in the Pyongyang right now? At the meeting between uh, President Putin and uh, Kim Jong-un, the comprehensive strategic partnership agreement was signed between North Korea and Russia. In particular, it is known that the strengthening military cooperation, including automatic military intervention in case of emergency, will be discussed. <coughs> what impact do you think this will have on security and the peace on the Korean Peninsula as well as in Ukraine? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not going to comment on specific agreements between uh, Russia and the DPRK other than to say our focus continues to be on promoting regional security and stability in the region, uh, as well as our uh, extended deterrence efforts as it comes to supporting our ROK and Japanese allies. Uh, and so uh, I'll just leave it at that. One more quick. Uh, Paul LaCamera, commander of the U.S. and ROK Combined Forces Command, put the brakes on the South Korean government loudspeaker broadcast against North Korea. And the South Korean government stated that the resumption of a loudspeaker broadcasting was a self-defense measure in response to North Korea's dangerous you know, garbage balloon provocations. What is the Pentagon's assessment on this? Yeah, so I'd, I'd have to refer you to USF, SFJ um, to respond to that. I, don't, I just don't have any insight to provide on that. Does it mean that North Korea can provocate to South Korea, but South Korea cannot provocate? Uh, again, y you're asking me a question about uh, an order that or a request that General Camera made. I'd refer you back to USFJ for any details on that. Again, I think it's very clear that the United States and ROK are working very closely together when it comes to addressing security c concerns and threats on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we obviously have a long-standing alliance, uh, and we continue to deepen that alliance, all focused on making sure uh, that the people of South Korea, uh, as well as the broader Indo-Pacific region, uh, can be assured of peace and security in the region. So again, I'd refer you to USFJ or USFK for additional details. Let me go to Louis here. Um, there are claims. Well, there was a statement today by Prime Minister Netanyahu that the United States has not been providing uh, weapons and munitions to Israel uh, recently, and he called the United States to uh, resume that. Um, is that the case? Uh, 
I think publicly the administration has acknowledged the 2,000 pound bombs um, with regards to Rafa, but it, has there been a slowdown? Has there been a delay? Is there a production issue? Uh, what, what is exactly is the Prime Minister talking about? Yeah, thanks, Louis. Um, so I won't comment on the Prime Minister's remarks themselves. As, as you've heard us say, we're absolutely committed to continuing to support Israel's inherent right to defend itself. Uh, since Hamas's vicious attack on October 7th, we've rushed billions of dollars of security assistance to Israel to enable them to defend themselves, uh, and we're going to continue to provide them with the security assistance they need, uh, again, uh, for defense. Uh, now, we've paused one shipment of high payload unguided munitions. Uh, there's not been a final determination uh, at this time on how to proceed with that shipment. Uh, as you've heard us say previously, there are concerns about the use of these munitions in a dense urban setting like Rafa. Uh, and we've been very clear with the Israelis about the steps that they must take to be effective in this fight. So I'm just going to leave it at that. So in other words, we, when you talked about rushing aid to Israel, that rushing aid continues? We continue to support Israel with security assistance uh, and their ability to defend themselves. As I mentioned, we paused one shipment uh, of 2,000-pound uh, bombs. Can I follow up on Laura's question about uh, the New York Times report about the pier? Sure. Can, can you confirm that military officials have told aid organizations that uh, potentially they, the pier, the J. Lodge Trident Pier, may be dismantled the next month? I'm not tracking any established timeline at this point in terms of when uh, the pier will stop operating. Again, with the caveat that this has always been intended to be a, a temporary pier, uh, I'm not aware uh, at this point of any established date of this is when we're going to stop. And again, taking a step back here, uh, the big picture, whether it be by land, sea, or air, uh, employing all avenues to get assistance into uh, into Gaza. I mean, when you just think for a second, you know, since the pier was put in place about a month ago, we've been able to, to shuttle over 3,500 metric tons or 7.7 .7 million pounds of aid onto the shore in Gaza uh, via this temporary pier. Uh, and we're going to continue to work very closely with, with aid groups. Uh, with the UN, with the Israelis and other regional partners uh, to look at ways to get additional aid uh, into the Palestinians to include via this maritime corridor. So uh, again, when we have anything new to announce, we certainly will, but as of right now, that's where we're at. David. You mentioned the shipment of <coughs> 2,000 pound bombs. Included in that shipment were also an even larger number, I think, of 500 pound bombs. Have the 500 pound bombs in that suspended shipment been released to go to Israel? Not to my knowledge. It's all part. It was all part of one shipment uh, that has been suspended. Uh, again, pending further uh, discussion. Okay, body. Thank you, General. Uh, on Rafah, um, have your Israeli counterparts uh, notified you that uh, the invasion of Rafah is um, ending soon? Um, I, I'm not. Uh, so first of all, what I'm tracking right now in Rafah is uh, we still continue to see Israel uh, along the uh, Philadelphia line. Um, they continue to conduct some limited operations into Rafah uh, to go after uh, Hamas uh, units and leaders. Um, we have not seen a large scale, you use the word invasion, we have not seen a large scale uh, ground operation at this point. We're continuing to monitor that. Again, we've been very clear about what our expectations are in terms of safeguarding civilians. I do know that a, a significant number of civilians have relocated elsewhere in Gaza. That said, uh, this continues to be a topic of discussion between our leadership uh, and Israeli leaders uh, when it comes to, to conducting operations both within Rafa, but also throughout Gaza. And uh, last week I asked you about the uh, civilian toll from the uh, uh, Nusayrat operation that Israel conducted to uh, rescue uh, four hostages. This uh, happened with uh, U.S. support, intelligence, and uh, logistics, as uh, Sullivan uh, acknowledged. Um, have you looked into uh, the number of civilians that were killed 
uh, during the uh, operation uh, while noting that the secretary yourself and the department have expressed many times concern about uh, human uh, toll because of these um, because of the Israeli operation yeah I don't I don't have any updates to provide in terms of estimated civilian casualties other than again um, we do know that there were civilian casualties as a part of that operation uh, I think the last time we spoke and, and this hasn't changed um, we continue to see two different numbers being put out by the Israelis versus Hamas I don't know what the facts are other than uh, there's an acknowledgement that there were civilian casualties as part of that operation. But again, uh, in, in all of our discussions, uh, uh, we continue to uh, expect and encourage the Israelis to take civilian casualties into account. Uh, again, uh, recognizing also um, what we talked about last time uh, was the fact that this was a hostage rescue uh, that you have civilians, uh, you have hostages being held among the civilian population uh, by an armed terrorist group, Hamas, uh, certainly exacerbating the, the tensions uh, and the, the challenging situation here. So we're going to continue to expect civilian casualties uh, to be taken into account, civilian harm mitigation to be taken into account uh, going forward. No one wants to see any innocent civilians killed in this crossfire, whether they be Palestinians or Israelis. Up on this. Um, but this is an operation that the U.S. supported with logistics and intelligence, and it led to high civilian casualties, according to local authorities in Gaza, more than 280. And as a matter of fact, you've been expressing concern about civilian casualties. Isn't, doesn't this require a look from the department into what actually happened? Uh, since you will as well uh, voting to keep supporting Israel in its efforts to rescue uh, the captives or hostages. Yeah, and, and just to, to clarify here, again, the U.S. was not a part of this military operation. We were not militarily involved. We did not have forces that participated. Uh, and again, um, broadly speaking, when it comes to Israel's hostage recovery efforts, uh, we've said that we are supportive uh, and in terms of providing intelligence information, um, but when it comes to this specific operation, uh, again, we were not involved in conducting or executing or planning this particular operation. You supported the operation. Well, we support Israel's inherent right to defend itself against Hamas. Uh, and again, we've recognized and acknowledged that way too many civilians have died in this conflict, and we're going to continue to encourage and expect our Israeli partners to take civilian uh, harm into account as they're conducting the operations. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Let me get to some other folks here. Yep. Hi. Uh, about the Fort Liberty and other Carolina forts getting the solar factories or solar farms, um, it's part of a Biden administration executive order that's planning for 100% clean energy to power the federal government by 2030. What percent of the way to 100% is the Defense Department? And in terms of the cost of this solar, these solar farms to power the bases, is it better financially for the department to use the solar power rather than, you know, go the traditional forms of energy? Yeah, let me take that question and we'll come back to you. Okay, yes. On the collision between a Chinese vessel and a Philippine supply ship near the second Thomas show on Monday, there are some reports that at least eight of the Filipino sailors were injured and one of them was severely injured. So what's the Pentagon's assessment on this collision on Monday and how much are you worried about the escalation of tension between Philippines and China? Yeah, so uh, obviously very concerning uh, reports, um, you know, in terms of the specifics as it relates to the Filipino sailors, I'd, I'd refer you to the Philippine government uh, for additional details, but, uh, and you've heard others within the U.S. government say this, uh, this kind of behavior is uh, provocative, it's reckless, it's unnecessary, uh, and as you highlight, it could lead to something uh, bigger and more violent. And so uh, we're going to continue to stand uh, with our Philippine allies. We condemn the escalatory and irresponsible actions by the PRC uh, to deny the Philippines from executing a lawful maritime operation in the South China Sea. Uh, and as you've heard Secretary Austin and others say, the Philippines' rightful legal maritime claims must be protected. 
Time for a few more. Yes, sir. Thank you, General. Um, regarding to the escalation in uh, south of Lebanon, um, so do you still have concerns that this war could be um, expanded between Hezbollah and uh, Israel? Um, and even if there is, um, uh, and if there is no deal for a ceasefire deal, do you believe the de-escalate could happen uh, very soon? And uh, do you still believe that Hezbollah is still not job in to full feet in this war? Yeah, we, we do remain uh, concerned about tensions along the, the border. Uh, and, and of course, we continue to encourage a diplomatic solution. Uh, preventing a wider regional conflict has been a primary focus uh, for this department and the, and the U.S. government uh, writ large since Hamas's attack on October 7th. Uh, and, and as you've heard Secretary Austin say, we're going to continue to work toward that end. Uh, so I'll just leave it there. I'm sorry, um, uh, the other one. Um, today, Hezbollah published a video of what it says it was a footage gathered from its monitoring <coughs> drone, um, uh, including the city of Haifa's sea and airport and some sensitive locations inside Israel. Have you seen that uh, video, and do you have any comment about that? I, I've not seen that video, so I'm, I'm just not able to comment. Let me do a couple more from the phone here. Let me go to Mike uh, from Washington Times. Hi, thanks, Pat. I was wondering if the Pentagon has a definition of uh, strategic success for uh, Operation Prosperity Guardian and the other uh, mission there in the uh, Red Sea area. I know you're shooting down a lot of drones and striking a few targets occasionally inside Yemen, but commercial ship traffic uh, through the region has not increased appreciably since it began. Uh, they, you know, playing Houthi whack-a-mole isn't the uh, objective here. So what actually is the objective where you can say we have succeeded? Yeah, thanks, Mike. So, you know, let me just kind of turn this around a little bit here because, you know, there's a, this discussion about, you know, has deterrence failed um, what, what is it that you're trying to achieve here? And it's it's what I talked about earlier, right? It's about preserving freedom of navigation in this vital waterway. Uh, and, and I would say that really it's the Houthis that have failed uh, to deter the United States and the international community from continuing to operate in the Red Sea. You know, they've conducted over 190 attacks, the vast majority of which have been knocked down thanks to U.S. and international efforts to help safeguard shipping and the lives of mariners uh, through operations like Operation Prosperity Guardian. And additionally, as I mentioned before, the Houthis have been all over the map in terms of their purported rationale for conducting these strikes versus the reality of their actual operations and the impact. Uh, whereas we've been, again, very clear why we're there, which is safety and freedom of navigation uh, in this vitally important waterway. So. Uh, strategic success looks like the ability of the international community to continue to uh, transit the Red Sea, uh, and we're going to keep after it. Thanks. All right, let me go to J.J. Green, WTOP. Thanks, General. Reuters is reporting right now that Israeli uh, defense forces have approved operational plans for an offensive in Lebanon. And this is one of the things, the three things that the U.S. military was trying to prevent when it was sent there, the expanded forces were sent there. Any thoughts about that? And then secondly, the Russian flotilla has moved away from Cuba and moved on to someplace else. Can What can you share about what you learned about what they were doing there and um, keeping tabs on them now, where they may be going, where may, be, may they be going? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, JJ. Um, again, I'm when it comes to the situation along the uh, Israel-Lebanon border, again, our, our focus is on uh, working with partners in the region to include Israel, obviously, uh, to encourage a diplomatic resolution. Uh, so I'm not going to get into hypotheticals or speculate on, on what might happen other than to say no one wants to see a wider regional war. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll stay focused on that. Um, as it relates to uh, any Russian naval activity, uh, you know, near Cuba, um, look, I'll, I'll refer you to the Russian uh, MOD or Navy to talk about their, their current operations. As you know, and as you've heard us say, uh, we obviously closely monitored, um, don't see any uh, threat to the homeland, uh, and, and these types of exercises are not new. Um, we've, we've seen them take place, you know, over the years. Uh, so, again, nothing concerning from our standpoint, but we'll, again, continue to monitor. 
Okay, I can do a couple more. Yes, ma'am. Um, so earlier today, Taiwanese Defense Minister Ku said uh, that they should expect the delivery of the 2B anti-tank missiles and 100 launch purchase missiles uh, by the end of this year. Number one, why is it taking this long? Why isn't there a two-year delay? Uh, look, I, I don't have any specifics to provide in terms of uh, aid deliveries to Taiwan, um, other than to say, again, in accordance with the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, we will continue to work with Taiwan to ensure they have the capabilities uh, that they need to defend themselves. And let me go ahead and go to Carl here. I just have a follow-up to Louis' question. If, you know, the U.S. paused one shipment of 2,000-pound bombs to Israel. Um, since then, how many security packages has the U.S. military provided Israel? I, I don't have any statistics to pass along, Carla, other than to say, again, you know, from the outset of uh, Hamas's attack on Israel, uh, we have worked closely to ensure that they have uh, security assistance they need to defend themselves. So there have been additional packages since then? Correct. Okay. Yep. And then to follow up what you said to me, you said that the um, global leader of ISIS, he doesn't seem to have a long life expectancy. Can you confirm that the U.S. military targeted the global leader of ISIS on a strike on May 31st? Um, you know, there was a, uh, I, w I would just point you back to AFRICOM's statement. I don't have anything uh, additional to provide at this point. Of course, if there's updates, um, we'll be sure to let you know. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate it.